recording. Welcome everybody. This is May 30, the so-called Monday development meeting. Progress on Open Source Ecology's development team. So if you look at the document, uh, let's let me share my screen so you can take a look at it. And we're going back to Hangouts here. We had a little difficulties with the uh, with the Jitsi, but we are getting a guy on a team who's a good web guy, and we're talking about he should be joining in about a week. But he's he's gonna install the Jitsi video bridge, which is basically the un unlimited participation kind of a video meeting. Uh, according to the description of that program, it seems like the way it manages its memory and, and users is that really you can have just about unlimited numbers of people and you only show show the ones that are active and stuff like that. So there's good hope on that, uh, but for now, just doing the Hangouts in the interim. So uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, share screen. Okay. Um, so if you take a look at my screen, so let's let's go to page one, and uh, the agenda. I try to simplify the agenda, but um, no new people this week as far as the team goes. The team numbers are good. Um, we're hovering around nine or ten contributors about 150 hours per week uh, of contributor effort on several projects. Uh, the big thing is I talked to Joseph yesterday at length about community management and we're going to promote Joseph to the commun technical community manager role for the team, a person who's actually going to check in with people, who's going to work on providing instructionals, uh, onboarding, like really getting people clued into the process and onboarding in the most effective way so because one of the things here is like we're doing everything at once there's technical development there's building a team and onboarding so i mean we've been uh getting like one or two new people per week since february we're at, at a total of 19 people right now but with that comes some growing pains as in you have to figure out how to manage a larger number of people so far we have broken down into a couple of teams so right now we're having the 3d printer meeting and the CNC torch table and filament extruder in the next hour. But Joseph will be uh, possibly checking in with you. The idea there is uh, the first task for Joseph we talked about was we're going to do an onboarding video, like a five minute quick onboarding video, which tells you about all the resources, the, all the practices that we do, just to try to get people on the same page. Because the onboarding part, it is. It can be confusing. There's just a lot of different slight nuances of how we do things that that can allow for much more effective collaboration. So, um, and we definitely look for other people on the team to, to fill in other roles. I'm going to share this slide here, but uh, one of the things to, to think about in a serious way is training of our people and badges. Like right now we have the badge uh, for the basic free cat badge that you guys have gotten. But we want to certify training on, on many other areas. So some of the other things that we have to have clear procedures and clear certifying procedures for would be doing things like the exploded part animations, language agnostic instructionals. Uh, regarding language agnostic instructionals, Roberto is actually producing a document, uh, a video, a, a tightly edited video. We just went through the script and I have to follow up on that still regarding how do you make a language agnostic instructional for um, taking taking isometric views from FreeCAD and making very nice high quality build instructionals that don't even use use language they they just show pictures so like IKEA style fabrication diagrams very important so that's that's in progress um, then we will need to do a Caden Live instructional because while we have used Caden Live a little bit <clears throat> we haven't been really trained in it. Uh, the other thing going on is, which which a lot of the team can actually get into, is <clears throat> actually relatively advanced functionality, and that is finite element analysis. Basically, um, we can have a lot of people on the team do it. It's not that complicated. Basically, the idea is 
you take your design you put a force on it like okay this tractor frame has got like 1,000 pounds or 5,000 pounds weighing down on it and FreeCAD will tell you okay if you have that and your structure is like that you got steel this is how much it will bend so that's the level of um, that's that's called finite element analysis that's like real real computer aided engineering stuff but we can do that kind of stuff within FreeCAD um, so Cedric actually went on to that because we're going to be making larger frames of 3D printers, so we have to know some of that. But that's another skill we're going to get. Um, eventually, we're going to get a badge for how do you design a 3D printer. We're, we're working around a 3D printer construction set. We're going to teach people how to actually design a 3D printer from scratch using our methodology. And then more, more tools. KiCad, GIMP, Inkscape. KiCad is for electronics design, GIMP and Inkscape are for graphics. So those are some of the key tools that we'll be using. As far as community development, um, the thing that, I mean, especially after yesterday's meeting, I was kind of like frustrated, things weren't going as planned, the, the video crapped out. Uh, but one of the things I noticed yesterday being kind of frustrated, I see I need more support on the, the running the meetings and, and leadership. And that's where I actually, <clears throat> that's why I talked to, to Joseph I'm continuing these conversations with others as far as who can step into kind of more leadership positions. So one thing that really needs to happen is a meeting facilitator, someone who actually prepares the meetings, organizes the whole presentation for the Monday meeting. It takes a few hours, like a couple of hours. Maybe if you do a really good job, it, yeah, I think it takes about two hours so that I can focus on my unique ability, which is the larger perspective. And I think my role is going to be a lot about training materials, uh, that uh, overall development process training because I'm very familiar with that we're pioneering that so meeting facilitator would be a great addition uh, to the team we don't have a clear pathway for that community manager so so technical community manager is Joseph um, he's stepping up to the role curriculum development is is a big one that is who actually teaches us basically scrapes everything that we all learn on a team and actually puts puts that into nice instructionals or videos that's curriculum both for training like on the tools as well as the processes that we're going through just making that accessible to new people on the team so that people who have learned a lot of stuff already like a lot of people already have learned quite a bit of different skills on graphics the the cad and design work and we want to capture that so curriculum is part of that um, we're going to need an OSE Linux maintainer. Like right now, some of us are using OSE Linux, some aren't. That's the, uh, in principle, the US, on, on a USB stick, you can run lin the OSE Linux with all the software. But we want to get, like, as, as time goes on, that's going to become more important because uh, different software conflicts will be more prevalent. Like, if we have a whole bunch of, this whole software suite that somebody, that we all use, uh, it will save people a lot of time and make sure we are on the same page. Because even right now, I'm seeing like people are using different versions of FreeCAD, and and I know that FreeCAD's behaving differently for different people. For example, I cannot get the exploded part animations not to crash on me, and I've tried that multiple times. I always get major crashes happening. It's really unstable. Uh, so we got to figure out details like that. Uh, another thing in the community development part is a maintainer of the part library. So the part library is the, the master, uh, pretty much the master collection of the parts that we use to make designs like the 3D printer. So that's, that's basically that. Um, so I want to spend the rest of the time here, just a few minutes, uh, talking about the roadmap, like kind of backing up a little bit and evaluating where we are and what, where, more like where we're going because some of the feedback that I got was that people are confused like how all the projects fit together. So I have a, a decent slide here on that uh, and just to wrap up the process management part which I talked about the community building, uh, the process management like the team, the team is not just like CAD people and engineers there's a lot more that happens and that's process management like the overall development process facilitation of the meetings community management curriculum development product owner like like product owner is the guy that cares about the the outcome like the guy who's going to use it like for example I'm a product owner for the 3d printer because I'm going to be building more of these and running workshops and so forth and so I'm really explicitly functioning as the product owner there kind of like the technical lead um, then there's a maintainer of 
of the part library. So that's that's kind of like some of the functions of the team, and you can you can get more specific and more refined as far as what the actual team looks, team composition looks like. Uh, and we're going to be, I mean, we're refining this. We're making the road by walking, as I always say, to to develop this open development process, which is uh, very unique. Because, uh, you know, just to share this, the major, major revelation from my side after years of OSE is that you can get a highly functioning team working and you can you can set high expectations of the team. And the way that you keep to the contributions, like the commitments, as opposed to the ad hoc people come in and out, which has been the history of the project for many, many years before this, uh, the idea is you put attention on the actual recruitment process and you get you, you have people pass through certain barrier to, to entry to the actual team so that you show commitment and skill set that's required. So, so for that, for us here, that is the free CAD test and the basic interview process and the expectation of the 10 hours per week. The, the fact that uh, we have high expectations and if those expectations are not being met, then we have a conversation. But uh, the idea is we have to keep to that kind of commitment so that everybody's motivated and we're producing. So that's the bottom line is creating the new economy. That, that's not a walk in the park. That's a big commitment on the part of many people. You can't have people simply come in and out. But for me, that's been a, a great revelation, as I mentioned before, about uh, where I got that idea from was from a friend from the TED Fellows community who runs the Rare Genomics Project, which has 165 doctors, like high-level professionals, volunteering 10 hours per week. So I took that model. Okay, let's say, let's get people on the team in a serious way. Um, let's vet them. Let's approve them and have a high-functioning team. So that is possible. Um, it's it's very unique to have a high high functioning team like that. That's what we're working on, but uh, it's not well known that. I mean, most people would probably tell you that that's not possible. How do you get volunteers to do that and actually keep to their commitments? That's it's not easy. So uh, that's where we are on that. Okay, so let's talk about the the 3D printer roadmap, kind of where we stand on the development. So um, altogether for the year, we're the the year this year is a lot about tools development. Um, like fabrication tools a lot. So that means 3D printer, torch table, and we will get into the heavier duty machines like the heavy duty drill press, lathe, mill, router. That comes straight out of the 3D printer construction set. And I've mentioned this already, but simply scaling up the parts to much larger rod sizes from the 5 sixteenths of today up to two inches. There's no reason why you cannot do that. That is what we can do to make very heavy duty machines. So, so that whole kind of a tool chain is gonna be worked on this, this year throughout. And right now, um, here's where we are in a 3D printer. We have done the CAD. We have done excellent exploded part animations. Let me see if there's, actually I'm gonna go to the next, uh, the slide number four. Actually, you can see all the links to all these products. Well, you can see that on the next page here. I'll keep it simple, but Explode Part Animations. Now we're at the LAI Language Agnostic Instructionals phase. And um, the 3D printer construction set file. So I'm gonna focus on this part. The 3D printer construction set is the idea that right now we're simplifying the assemblies so that they're super lightweight and we can make complete printers, 3D printers and larger machines like big 3D printers and closed 3D printers. Um, so the idea is why are we focusing on that? People like Israel and the team, um, let's see, like if we look at who's on the team for simplifying the CAD files, we got Israel, Marchant, Io, Jonathan, so it's really Israel and Io working on that. Uh, the other people are kind of doing other things. But the idea there is we get to design a bunch of other different variations of the 3D printer. Why? So first of all, the frame that we cut out is nested out of many pieces. And when you do the CNC cut, you cut the frame, the outer frame, and then the inner frames. So we end up with a 16 inch, a 13 inch, a 10 inch, and an eight inch frame from a same piece of steel. Therefore, we got to design those things very carefully. Well, we've already done the design on a 16 inch and an 8 inch. So the 8 inch is the D3D Mini, the 16 inch is our main one. But we've got the 13 inch and 10 inch. 
that are like separate instances. You got to design that so you know how to build it. Like what are all the rod lengths and all the details, optimizing the bed, you know, how the, the print bed size that's going to be there. You have to simply draw the full design if you're going to go, if you're going to have a meaningful design that someone doesn't spend a lot of time building. It's, it's buildable. So there's more. We have a 24 inch frame size. Like I actually got one of those cut out here. That could be a larger printer. Six foot tall, 16 inch version. We can do that. Then 16 inch by 32 inch by six feet. We're talking about some big machines now. Then a, an enclosed chamber version. That means you gotta fit everything inside and like kind of close the sides off with uh, an enclosure like like film, like uh, like sheets of, uh, like even overhead film, like you can actually close off the gaps w with some kind of a closure on um, on a frame. And then there's 3D printer construction set, the idea that you can build any kind of printer size. Say you got some random frame that you picked up somewhere, uh, you can build any size. So you can have plastic frames local and like IO is working on. Uh, PVC frame with PVC corners. You can hang the entire guts or the, all the axes on the plastic frame as well. Okay, now what's the 3D printer construction set? So uh, Lashlow is, um, once we get the 3D printer construction set simplified files, we're going to put them into FreeCAD. So it's a workbench where you can pull those down. And a very good functionality for the 3D printer construction set would be the idea that um, within FreeCAD, you can actually p pull down a part and you can say, okay, I want to make this 15 inches long or 20 inches long for any of the axes so you can pull down a part with exact dimensions so you don't have to me mess with it so that would be kind of the end all of the 3d printer construction set workbench you pull down the parts but at very specific sizes so that you can literally design a 3d printer of any size and shape um, the construction set idea is, is live here so that's the 3d printer construction set files now the idea is as a result of the workshop here in-house I've got like 12 or more frames left but they're the odd sizes they're the 13 inch and 10 inch which nobody signed up for that during the workshop so I got at least 12 of those so I need to build a bunch of I want to print, build a, a print cluster here so we're, we're printing all our parts for the for the uh, next iteration of the work workshop so I talked about the 3d printer construction set workbench and then finally um, an ebook uh, which we publish and put on our website there's also a universal controller, basically a larger controller for the 3D printer, uh, which leads us to CNC torch tables, which is the next working group. Uh, also, there's another person uh, that's not on these meetings, but another collaborator who's, who's working with us on a CNC circuit mill. So we're taking the frame of the, the D3D and using our same axes, we're just adding a, a router head to it, a small router for milling circuits. And then we expand the sizes, like the one inch axis, if you click on that here, um, you can see that we have already designs for the one inch rod version of the, the 3D printer construction set. And I mentioned two inch rod version, we, that we don't have yet, but we have the one inch version already. Um, the other thing I'm putting on this, on this roadmap is the OSE extruder. So basically the extruder, like if you buy it off the shelf, it might be like 50 bucks. But what you can do is use use hollow threaded rod and washers and so forth to make a hot end yourself. So a custom hot end that, that you can literally have like a, like a, this is not for filament making. This is for extruding the actual printing of plastic. So something that we can scale to bigger sizes, like if you want to have a super large nozzle size, like over one millimeter, as opposed to like 0.4 millimeter or 0.5, that's standard. We can do that, but we, we want to open source the extruder as well. And uh, uh, Cedric has done like the next iteration of the extruder, but, but we've got more work to do. And basically like a super low cost that's made of uh, the extruder part that's made of like really hard, standard hardware parts, minimal machining uh, that we want to do. And it might be a little confusing for people what that's about, but there's a, there's a task waiting for somebody there like later on. So this is all like, you know, a lot of different things here. We got the print cluster. We're, we have another team on a filament maker, which we want to prototype for the next workshop and possibly add it to the next workshop. And then if you have a print cluster, uh, let's talk about a 3D print shop, a shop where you're actually uh, producing parts of all kinds 
for sale, like whether it's 3D printer kits, uh, CNC circuit mill kit, filament extruder kits, cordless drills. So, so this is like really cool stuff. 3D printed cordless drills, which are then lifetime designed because you never throw them away because you can replace all the parts. A uh, little drill press, aerial drones, plumbing fittings, leaf eliminator, like on a CD Co home, uh, there's a leaf eliminator for the rainwater catchment. Um, that's a $30 part. We can print it for like, you know, a few bucks, like two bucks in parts. First flush diverters for rainwater con collection, plastic fence posts, plastic lumber. These are just some of the things that I ran off, ran into, like just building things around here and building the CD Co home. Like all these parts here are at least like $30 and they really cost you like 10 times as less if you print them from your own 3D printing filament. Well, if you make your own 3D printed, printed filament, then literally the price drops down even further. So the filament maker is very important. But that's the general workflow. This, this here is uh, all the parts around the 3D printer project. So basically the 3D printer construction set files, the simplification of the more complex files that allow us to quickly design all these different versions. So as we get more people on the team, uh, imagine we had more people, like right now we're kind of sp spreading the team onto different projects, but then we can um, ultimately design all these various things in parallel when we have more people on the team. So that t totally lends itself to, okay, all of us, um, we basically have the specific requirements for how to work with the 3D printer construction set parts, and then we make different sizes of machines. Because each one of these, I mean, it's a full, you know, that's a full-time job for for a few weeks, you know? So if we spread spread that between all the different people, we can actually design all these different variations because there's a, just a lot, a lot of work that's involved. I mean, that's, that's the deal. Um, to do this properly with the ambition of creating a super highly replicable construction set for doing this, um, yeah, it's, it's, it has high potential to spread. Already I got a couple of requests of people looking to to build this people asking me okay where do i download your files for the 3d printer and people asking about that people in classrooms and other places and other countries uh, asking me about this on email so yeah i mean and you know we hardly have a product yet you know we still have to do refine the print quality to make our print cluster so we got a we got a lot of work to do but that's the basic flow for where we are on the 3d printer construction set and um that's pretty much it. I mean, I think my part, like what I'd like to get more time on is to uh, teach people more about the process of development, like the, using the development template, um, starting with things like generating a, an, um, a, a, um, a taxonomy. Basically, like when we work on a project, right now we have kind of like various pages on the on the wiki but there is some sense to it they are they do try to follow this overall development template and it's important that at the end of the day we use very standard taxonomy for everything that we do like like um whatever we do we do do something like whatever part we're working on call it x modular breakdown x conceptual design X requirements that happens for, that can happen for every project and for every module so so on the wiki if you know if you go to X electronics schematics you know that you're gonna get the electronics schematics for X and so forth if you go to X BOM bill of materials then you know you're gonna get the for example d3d BOM or if you you know want to get the build instructions you go d3d build instructions and that page shows up with exactly what you expect that kind of culture everybody on a team has to get so i want to spend more time actually teaching people like how do we actually simplify this because this is like when i look at this right now this can be simplified and we need to teach people how to manage all the data within a project effectively because because the only way we're going to scale as a project is, is really if everybody understands a clear taxonomy of how ev uh, well how everything is documented on one level and then we can actually create realistic burn downs burn down graphs so so for example generating a uh basically by knowing by filling out a spreadsheet of where we are on each each uh part of a project we can generate a burn down as a function of time so that's some some little thing we need to do so this is all this kind of various different infrastructure stuff 
related to the development method that still needs to be developed and um, a lot of work there so so let's go to the next phase here so that that was kind of like the roadmap thing and um, let's see and maybe I want to get some feedback here before we go into reviewing where everyone is because right now a lot of stuff is in process but um, uh, Joseph do you have any any words to say or any requests from from the team members do you want to pipe in after a conversation yesterday or okay I don't know Joseph going 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 yeah um, so regarding the I think the yeah let's let's just keep going here so uh, one thing that's in progress that I know is the the language agnostic instructionals procedure and protocol that's in place that Roberto did a really good job on and we're continuing on that but let's talk about more about um, the allocation of the different roles for today so let's see we've got the meeting on the on the torch table and the filament extruder at, at noon time but um, as far as let's see let's see who we have here um, on the simplification of the files maybe I could check back in with uh, so Israel and IO um, any uh, any updates on the progress there like does that make sense what I said like about simplifying the files because we've got a lot of different design work that we can then distribute after that that point uh, because essentially after we simplify all the files we can do a nice instruction okay here's how you actually design a 3d printer using all the existing parts so that will be the next work there um, you want to pipe in there yeah it's um yeah, so can you hear me? okay io um, go ahead io yeah and um Okay. Uh, I, I, or you cut out. If are you still trying to speak there? If not, we can get to Israel. Israel, you want to pipe in? I think yeah, I'll cut uh, out. Sense. Um, yeah. I don't know if uh, I'm doing it properly as far as uh, uh, simplifi simplified CAM yeah. files. Yeah. Uh, but I'm basically just using the measure feature on uh, yep. on FreeCAD to get measurements and then just doing a simple block or, or you know, circle yeah. and extruding or pocketing. Yep. Uh, That's exactly right. It's been pretty straightforward, but it's slow. Yeah, yeah. And the focus is, um, I noticed you did a lot of different, different... Sorry, me as well. Um, okay. Well, progress has been pretty slow. Again, it's still the same thing about FreeCAD. So, um, I'm discovering FreeCAD in bits and pieces. It's a bit confusing. Some things that should work don't seem to work, and then I yeah. wonder why those things are not working. So, I'm spending a lot more time finding my way around yeah. and then doing the actual tasks that need to be done, which led me to wonder if support in terms of free time, because if if I could just throw my questions at somebody and just get quick response all the time, maybe the learning curve will be like easier for me to overcome. Um, what have you done so far as far as trying to get those quick answers? D did you say you, you did something? Like... I just use Google, I use the FreeCAD manual, I yeah. search for YouTube videos, I just go online and search, basically, that's what I do. Okay, well, you know what, I think we, we can enlist Emmanuel, he's the best guy on FreeCAD here, he's our, you know, he could teach us a lot of stuff. I was, I'm going to say, what we should establish as a procedure is we email Emmanuel, so Emmanuel, if, once you see this video, you've been promoted. <laughs> 
uh, but yeah, I think Emmanuel was pretty um, pretty straightforward and pretty forthcoming on helping different people figure out stuff on, on FreeCAD. Uh, I know I can get pretty quick answers from him normally. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to email him. I'm, I'm sorry, you cut out a little bit. Hold on, hold on. Let me just catch this. Hold on, hold on. Anyone got that? Uh, you were cutting in and out a bunch during that. Sorry. Um, I was saying that rather than emailing Emmanuel, that could we just set up a thread on the network for free card issues so that uh, we can archive like questions and answers, like frequently asked questions for new people trying to get on with free card. And um, that could be a repository that new people could go to to like get quick help on known issues with free time. So just having another thread like the 3D printer development group on there. Yes, on the network exactly. Yeah, I think that I think that would probably be a good idea. Or post it on the wiki. Yeah, I think, I think what might be useful there is because it, uh, usually when I ask questions about something like that, I'm asking a really obvious question. It's kind of dumb. So if maybe like a weekly summary of free CAD questions could be posted to the wiki to kind of uh, uh -huh. have a more permanent repository of problems we've solved. And then, then we can filter out the stuff that gets, gets asked every single week. Yeah. If that makes sense. Well, I think the other aspect is developing competency on FreeCAD and, of course, getting every up to level of mastery to where, you know, everybody is up to speed, which, again, it's a little bit of work in terms of cur curriculum development, which, again, that would be working with Emmanuel and getting some level of, uh, yeah. you know, management on that. Uh, uh, right. Jonathan, you're saying, what are you saying? You're going to work with Emmanuel to get some curriculum happening? What I'm saying is that we can onboard a curriculum developer, or if not, we, we that's one of the roles I guess that we can start developing. Which, yeah. Again, yes, yeah, so I can, I can help with that, but I think the main issue is is about management being able to get. Uh, yeah. You know, we need to check with everybody and find out where they where are they in their level of competency and what roadblocks they're having, and then getting them up. So I I would say a not only a process coach but a free CAD coach of some sort to yeah. be able to get people up to speed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, the thing that really needs to happen there is like a deliberate search for a person like that. So how do we do that? Correct. You need to find an MBA or something. <laughs> well, I mean, we can do it on the uh, volunteer match, but the main issue is someone who does who specializes in training. Yeah. Uh, which again, I have an acumen for that, but long-term solution is going to be actually having assessments where we can develop some real curriculum where we can go in and start presenting these. But as far as direct, immediate, pragmatic approach right now, it's going to be finding everybody on the development team to get them up to speed. And, and of course, it's going to require a little bit of one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so, yeah. which, March and I got your um, email, and I'll respond to that in terms of some of that, uh, what you've emailed me, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a discussion I had with, uh, with Joseph uh yesterday we were talking about so so joseph um uh, he's kind of like doing that curriculum developer kind of a thingy right now in a sense so starting with the onboarding video because one of the first things is first it's like what's the process overall process so so people really get onto that quick so we we decided uh let's do a quick five minute onboarding video and possibly like the second thing we we should do, Joseph, is um, we talked about Caden Live, but I think FreeCAD might be like getting, um, really getting the workflows in FreeCAD well understood 
because for example one thing I know that works well with FreeCAD is setting up individual files for everything that once you're working on a design you're opening up individual files that kind of workflow is very very powerful um, and probably most people here don't appreciate that but there's there's nuances to it but anyway um, I see Joseph that you um, unmuted yourself there Joseph you want to uh, pipe in a little bit Yeah, I can't hear you though if you're speaking. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can't hear you. So, yeah, I mean, that's a definite, definite gap there. And, you know, like, um, yeah, that's a, that's a role that I should be spending a lot of time on in terms of um, producing more training. And right now, yeah, it's really possibly the some of the you know the next people that come on the team I don't think you really need like as far as how to how to do that you don't need a person who knows FreeCAD you need a curriculum developer so someone who can document what somebody else knows or I, I think that's that's uh, not a bad idea because uh, a lot of times the FreeCAD person they're not gonna really know yeah they might not be the best people to teach you about FreeCAD so I think a person that's more the more the generalist who is a good student, who can learn things and teach things, I think that kind of a kind of a role maybe is more um, more needed. In other words, you don't have to be a pro at FreeCAD to ask a pro how to use FreeCAD and translate it to somebody else, because then you, as the person, the curriculum developer, you would be testing what that person tells. Uh, as far as the instructions go and I think that's a way to do like twice as much in the teaching process because you're not only getting the information from the, from the expert but you're also vetting it because does it work for you things like that so um, and yeah and there's plenty of great resources but it's like how do we uh, as Israel says um, but yeah just getting that learning curve down and I think uh, yeah I mean there's my imp impression of a lot of the different resources they're scattered all over the place so we need to really start refining that and, and getting a, a more focused program um, to do that now yeah a lot of, yeah. yeah a lot with knowledge management being able to centralize a lot of the information and then of course coordinating that I mean I would agree that curriculum development yeah is a huge part and then uh, assessments for mastery but also to just follow up and and as a team, being able to get that feedback and saying, okay, look, I'm falling behind here. I need some help with that, which, again, I think that's sort of been issued. But um, yeah. making time available for that would be good. Uh, yeah. So I, supplementary to this. Yeah, so I'm hearing a response from Dixon. And that's Dixon's piping in, and he might be interested. And I talked to Dixon, touched on this before through through the interview. So I'm definitely going to take it up with with him regarding the more of the curriculum development. Because I know there's... There are some some definite uh, high leverage or high impact things we can teach about FreeCAD that we haven't done because at first like the the initial batch of people that w were on a team they you know like Emmanuel especially they just mastered it and uh, but that knowledge wasn't transferred to others there's a lot of new people that uh, spent that well that didn't yet spend the time so it's it's about just quickening that process so definitely i'll take it up with dixon tomorrow because i'm actually meeting with dixon tomorrow so that would be good um yeah um in the meantime yeah yeah so israel saying personally been working on a dev team itself on files that have been designed and well documented will itself be a great teaching learning resource well part of that is that we want to document like for every file that we generated there's technique of how you what's the most quick way to do it because you can you can design a part in like a hundred different ways but there's better ways and worse ways so we should we should kind of set some standards for that and uh, and I think a lot of that would come out like once we examine okay here's all the parts for d3d how they were generated like we we should uh, that will fall out of that process out of documenting a lot of the different parts that we build because i think the main product is okay here's a quick video like like the very focused video would be okay here's how you not only design redesign and put together like all the parts in d3d 
like for the 3D printer. Because that's something we want to produce for the greater world in general because we want to empower anybody to, to actually do the design work themselves. So, and I don't believe that you're going to need like, you know, months of time to, to learn that. I believe that's a few days. Like with a good, good set of instructionals that we can get people pretty much, bam, like with a very clear purpose saying, oh, wow, I can design a 3D printer and I can build it because here's all the parts and BOMs. So I think that uh, that's simply indispensable or critical to, to this going viral. I mean, my, my goal on this um, that I'd like to share with everybody on the team is, is that, I mean, this, this is great potential. I mean, nobody's doing the construction set approach like we are. So I think this has just immense potential to spread. So, yeah. Now, but as far as what we do, like, in the immediate term, so... Uh, let me just look at some of the people here. I mean, I think so. So the people who are working on a file simplification for now, um, I mean, literally, the task is as simple as a block, some rods and maybe a peg. Like, I, I, I mean, let me just point out to on the part library. Yeah, I mean, this this thing we really got to get straight on the part library. So I, I created this separate document. So let me go to d3d part library uh, I broke down the main part document into one is modules and one is one is parts so the second index is the assembly index but basically the here's the critical thing um, so I'm gonna just go into that document if you're still seeing my screen there uh, but in this document the critical things are these three items like right here I mean where my cursor is the x y1 y2 z like simplify those and that's a lot right there um, the idea for the cable chain the cable chain itself is like multiple megabytes unless you radically thrash it and simplify it and what I'm saying there for IO is there's one block and there's like a cylindrical block that's it forget about all the, ge the internal geometry just make one block and a second cylindrical kind of cylindrical like block just the simplest thing that still, when you put a bunch of them together, it looks like a cable chain and so forth. So just pretty much st stripping everything except of the outer dimensions of any object. So for the axes, it's just a block, two rods, another block, another block. And But you also need the the end stop is critical and the the stepper motor is critical. Besides that, that's it. You just have to notify, you know, make sure that that's shown in the in the file. All the bolts, all the bolt holes, throw that all out. All the magnets, all all minor details, internal details, belts, they don't interfere when you're putting the machine together. So that's that's basically it. But as soon as we have that, I mean, we're literally ready. Like uh, I've talked to Lashlow about putting that as a as a workbench in FreeCAD. So I need to check back with him. But but I mean, he's willing. He he knows some Python, so so we can actually code up a very simple workbench where you drag and drop those parts and select the the lengths. So that that's a more automated process. Um, but um, so that's that's for you guys there. Um, now Cedric, as I mentioned, he's getting onto the CAE thing, and the way this works, I think, for the team, the the way we can make this work is that like all of us like right now i think we're kind of scattered a little bit on multiple projects and that's okay i think i think that's that's decent and then what we should have be doing is the team the team ecology is that one person is the pioneer like maybe one or two people they go on to a new thing they go on to the new thing they learn it and then they teach the rest of the people and then working with together with the curriculum developer or the community manager they they teach everybody so that's that would be a, a decent workflows um, yeah so mm -hmm. now Roberto I he's working on uh, language agnostic instructionals part which is that gets you some some decent information about FreeCAD as well though not the specific part design and we've got the extruder and CNC team and website so that's kind of like all that we have for now um, yeah, then we, we got the meeting at, at noontime on uh, the other things. So I don't know. I mean, any any other questions for now? Because I'm um, seeing that. Um, yeah, any any other questions? Because uh, I don't know what, where to go from here. We, we just got to keep going on um, 
on the part simplifications and maybe like you know like as soon as just to get the learning going like as soon as we have one of the parts completely simplified like the x-axis like like you know i would ask israel um is the you know what's the status of the x-axis so if we take a look at that so we can maybe set an example for the other people so if we download that how good is it well i'm still seeing 941k so that's not done um yeah no yeah i've uh i've got all the let's see i got the idler the carriage and the motor printed parts simplified i just haven't put them, put them okay. together into the to the full assembly yeah 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 you know um one thing that might be worthwhile for us to do uh in israel maybe i'll request that as the next task that is once you've got that all in place let's document that in a very short video like what this process entails. because i think people were like really confused or it takes a little bit of time to explain what that whole thing is about um so Israel, I'll request that, that after you do this, generate the, the x-axis, we actually document how we did that and how we went through the thought process of what was important and what wasn't. Because that kind of pattern will be important for everything that we do. Like when we design tractors or the CNC torch table or whatever. That's going to be a skill that someone has to understand. Um, so I'm going to request that we do that. Like after, after you do the, the first one. I would say let's actually do the instructional on how to do that in like generalizing that for many different cases with this very specific case of uh the axis as as the point yeah would that yeah would that, yeah, that make good? sense uh yeah. also i got a question so yeah. on a couple of the uh, like one of the i i think it was the uh probably the idler i downloaded the, the part itself and I basically just deleted all the all the pads and put out the drawings themselves. You think that's fine? Because the drawings themselves you can use to I don't know rebuild the part or something. Uh, you, you removed all the all the uh, constraints at the end of the day. You saying? Uh, um. Well, I removed all all the paddings because because like at, at, at the you know you start with say a, a square and then you uh, you know pad that and then you do a pocket of some sort. Yeah. So over time, it like it just it just starts building up, right? Right, right. So I just removed all the pads and pockets and came to the simplest simplest. Yeah. Actually, but I left the drawings there just, just okay. for like posterity's sakes. Okay, okay. So so there's like a whole philosophy on how to go about it. Because did you know, for example, that all that you need to do, don't worry about erasing all those things. You can simply control C, control V into a new document. And I believe, I'm not sure, but but uh, I think by doing that, and if not that, there's other ways, you simply erase all the history of the parts. So copying into a new document will get rid of all that. And I think that will re decrease the memory. So we have to basically become familiar with that, those, those kinds of things. Like when you copy a part like into a new document versus just like cloning a part or making... Like there's various functionalities where you can simplify things, like get rid of details of history within FreeCAD. So I think maybe when we do the video, we can go through all those... Like there's like three or four mechanisms or routes, possibly even more. There's probably like five different routes uh, that we can use to simplify, like to get rid of the all those details, which which of course take up memory. So there'll be like basically, I think what's what's going to happen out of this um, first simplification of the first axis, we can document. Okay, here's all the things you need to know about simplifying parts, because because right now there's just so many different ways to do things that yeah, uh, it's absolutely not clear. So I think I, I look forward to doing uh, that, also, and we can get together on that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, on the wiki, when 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 you upload, I have cross links to files as well. So like trying to get as much cross linking as we can. That way, people aren't like looking all over the place for a particular file, the little simple file or not. Uh, how would you cross link where? Does that make sense? No. Uh, Crosslink how? So in the in the wiki, when you upload 
the, the simple file, say the uh, idler, you know, universal access idler, you upload the simple file and, and the original file that, that you're basically making a simple file for. Well, um, so that's that gets into details of how we manage the files there, but but uploading new versions of a file is the pre preferred way because in the history you can say, oh, this is the complex version, this is a simplified, so you can actually make notes on what every single version in a version history. You see, actually see that on the wiki. Did you know that? Yeah, I did, yeah. I, I, I was just talking in terms of, of being able to make sure that you're not duplicating work you know, uh -huh. that might have already been done. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's why we have the spreadsheet, though. Um, that spreadsheet should be like, there should only be one file corresponding to one of those items. Um, so in principle, the spreadsheet should be that thing. Like, there should not be other places where files are started that are different versions of those files. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that... that make sure that you're not duplicating work. Uh, could we somehow okay. reproduce that in the wiki itself? where sometimes we have to search for a file, basically. Um, yeah, I'm not clear about what you're saying because on the development team, or like say the D3D part library page, that's already there. Um, like if you go to the D3D part library, that's already embedded in a wiki, right? Um, so what, what else are you asking? Because that document, the spreadsheet, is already on the D3D part library page on the wiki. Whoops. Oh, that, this. Yeah, that basically uh, requires that we make sure that that document itself is is. That the document is what? Which may or not may not be, I think. Sorry, that, that is the most up to date. Is the most up to date? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The intent of the part index was that it, is, that it should be up to date, and uh, if it's not, I mean, we should make it so, because we can't have like multiple versions, two places where the same file resides, because that's just total confusion. So that's why, um, that was the reason for starting the part index, so that we don't do that. And then, like say the old versions of the file, we should just overwrite basically new versions of that file, like, yeah. Um, like, yeah. I mean, there should be, so, so in the spreadsheet, there's one CAD file link for the complex version, and then there's a simplified CAD file link. So here we're actually saying, no, actually do create a new file because there's so much difference between the two. Um, so I think that is good, but that's only in the individual parts. Yeah, that is gets kind of confusing. So I think you are calling out for some real clarity on this because because we're working with multiple ver multiple versions of the file. Um, we have to be very strict about knowing where those are and and i'm hoping i mean the intent of this this index is that i mean the part library page should be that where everything is so like between the part library and the index and then the final part like the actual pastings in here they should also be consistent those should be all the stuff that you see here should be actually the stuff that's in a in a spreadsheet yeah but yeah, it's it's kind of it gets kind of confusing. But I mean, I, I I do believe the spreadsheet. I mean, that's that's fine as long as we understand it. Maybe, but I guess that would that would call for uh, a very clear procedure of how we treat the spreadsheet. Like when do we create a new version of the same file and so forth. So I think I think some explanation is needed there. And so what you might be calling out for is is that's right. Like I don't think people are clear. Um, like where do you put a file for example you know like that simple simple thing like the taxonomy of the wiki where does the file go like one is the na name of a page on a wiki for a different machine so i'm, I'm going to generalize that to like once we have um you know many other projects going on right which we do i mean the taxonomy in the wiki title p title of the wiki page has to be there a person has to understand the the development spreadsheet taxonomy and then people have to follow procedures of, okay, we broke down the machine into certain parts so that the breakdown has to be documented somewhere. And that actually is in the development spreadsheet. The development spreadsheet says there's a exploded, like a, like a module breakdown. So when we're breaking these things, uh, 
like in the modules for the like an assembly index the assemblies here are actually modules but they're not broken down like randomly they they're actually like we know that that all these parts are already in a breakdown diagram and if it's not clear we should all get clear that there's actually another document um, that has the breakdown and that document was uh, on a d3d page and it's like this is where you know keeping track of everything is important but the d3d page should in principle have that and and in a d3d page it's actually under integration that showed like the initial integration no it's not where is that d3d no there's actually a page called d3d integration which shows the blow the explosion like the, the very initial explosion or like the breakdown of the machine which you might have seen this page this is called d3d uh, integration page but this basically shows all the different modules that we broke down a very long time like three months ago uh, th this was the initial breakdown uh, but once again this is where the like the it's really like a, the maintainer like the wiki maintainer for the project the library maintainer should have a very clear uh, process of documenting here's all the modules here's all the CAD and all that I mean for, for someone to be self-orienting on a team, you have to know like this whole taxonomy of things, you know, uh, which does get a little complicated. And that's why uh, I think special people who just focus on that, on understanding the taxonomy, like the maintainers in Linux, like those guys, um, that's what we need to, to introduce to this project. And so far, it's like, I kind of know it. Uh, well, I, I do know it. I know where every single thing is on, um, on the project, but we need to uh, start getting that knowledge transferred to other people and um, this is where it's kind of you know once we're getting into enough complexity here because we're we're working with so many different versions uh, what we're seeing here is that we're getting into bottlenecks and of understanding of how we actually organize information so um, what to do about that I think that's pretty pretty much my role to to maybe like uh, if we go back to the the development document I kind of started making notes that we need to start training people like for example like what I put on page 8 like these other community roles well they need to be documented and training needs to be provided for that like uh, maintainer like what I talked about is really like the maintainer role where you know what's the exact taxonomy where is everything and, and is everything up to date and you know what different versions are there so we definitely need to clarify that and maybe I can you know start um, preparing some documentation on that and I, and I guess we got to get to the next level on it because it's, it's not it's not that easy um, but definitely like some documentation around the actual taxonomy and structure which is a blend of this development spreadsheet and it's a blend of all the different versions yeah that just needs to be explained maybe maybe what I see happening there and um, is a is a really really well thought out instructional video on that that and that's really just drops it uh, now that kind of that type of a video takes a lot of hours actually to make so that's that's kind of like why it's difficult but I think to do a good video on um, on a taxonomy that will be like a 20 to 40 hour project because uh, I mean it sounds simple but once you start talking oh like once you start noticing all the details it's it's detailed but a five minute video like that uh, if it's at the level of the FreeCAD 101 video where it's just super tight it takes a long time but it's something we got to do we got to do it um, okay so we'll we'll quit here for now on this because we got to move to the next team but um, I guess between Israel and IO myself as soon as we have a broken a, a simplified access we should we got to do a, a video instructional on it so we want to kind of like slow down a little bit and, and do a nice video where we teach people um, all those different aspects of file simplification file management that we've learned so far that definitely I mean we're just not on the same page with everybody on that so um, yep Yep. Yeah, so links like we're talking about keeping Yeah. So what are we concluding on um on getting some training like a 
training workflow training training log on FreeCAD, the I/O conversation and Dix in Israel. What's what's the conclusion there? You're gonna start a wiki page or? Um, what we were talking about there at the end was I/O was saying that he started making videos, kind of documenting his frustration. I was just saying he should keep at it and link them to his work log. Okay. Um, but Definitely. we were talking about maybe starting a FreeCAD specific thread on the Mines network. Okay. Um, and then maybe I was bringing up earlier, maybe so there will be full documentation there, and then maybe once a week someone um, makes a summary that goes yeah somewhere on the wiki or somewhere else that kind of takes out the questions they get get asked every week or whatever you know. So we have a a condensed documentation somewhere else. So you'd propose um, so videos like little tiny videos of little features, and then somebody actually edits that into a final, like a nice summary every week. Well, I think what I was saying with the videos is he was just doing a, a vlog type format. Um, the, we could we could be more uh, active about that and have more people make videos of their frustration because yeah. that's. It's easier to communicate what's not working or working strangely through a video, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that would that would get more that would get people also uh, more proficiency on capturing video and and editing it. So that that would be extra yeah. built-in practice. Definitely. And you said VLOG. Yeah. 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 I, I think right. that's that's kind of the format he's he's doing. He's calling it free cat for dummies. But. Yeah. No, I totally agree. Vlogging, vlogging, you should be doing that. Like when I when I ask people to do videos, I mean, I, I'm literally asking for vlogs a lot of times. That's why. That's why, um, <laughs> as I mentioned about the videos without voice, um, are not super useful. Make sure you got voice when you do a video. That's uh, that's my only uh, right. peeve there. But yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, the vlogs. I mean, they're quick to do. Just you know, just doesn't take too long. I would like to have eventually on a team someone dedicated just to like taking all the vlogs or, or just consistently like producing a, a nice FreeCAD video like, okay, here's your five minute uh, FreeCAD training for the week, you know, like that right. would be good. We're not getting that right now. We we definitely want to add that, want to make sure that as time goes on, we want to have somebody uh, fill that role. And then of course, it's the question like, yeah, I mean, the deal is here that it takes takes a bunch of time to start up a, a good team effort that's for a high-performing team. So this is not easy. It, it's going to take some work. So, yeah. Okay. Um, with that said, yeah, uh, keep doing that. Keep the discussion live on a, on, a, on a network. Do you need me to start a FreeCAD dedicated thread on a network? Yeah, it, it looks like you have to do it. Okay. I can do that. That's, I mean, that's definitely worthwhile. I mean, FreeCAD is a world unto itself, and that being uh, an open source, extensible solution, it's we can make that do anything. So it's very important that we do learn everything about it, including things like getting to FreeCAD in the cloud. Uh, mm -hmm. There's not been a lot of discussion on that, but that's a simple extension of you know the next generation of FreeCAD. So that's that's just waiting to happen. And um, I suspect we might be the ones that end up doing that because uh, I haven't heard a lot of interest in that from the FreeCAD community itself. Like there were some, uh, I've looked into that discussion a little bit, but people are not particularly excited about it. I think it's probably because of where FreeCAD is. I think there's there's fir first things first on making it work better first, I guess. But that's that's something that's gonna come up in the future. Because I do yeah. think that, that cloud-based editing, where you're, you're actually editing something and you've got other people editing on the same doc within 3D, that would be, that would be a, a good thing. So, yeah, could be, could be a nice thing. Yeah. I mean, whichever way, whether it's like real-time or actually like you just upload stuff like automatically or something, yeah. Um, we do need um, a more yeah. collaborative version of FreeCAD. That it's not just on your desktop. So, um. Yeah. Are you, are you seeing Israel's comment saying he needs his password reset? I'm not sure if yeah. that's something you do or the yeah. overall minds people have to do. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'll, yeah, Israel, let's follow up on that. If you're going to show me what, just maybe send me a screenshot of what, what's happening right now. I'll just uh, I'll look into that. Um, okay, so let's move on to the, um, yeah, uh, move on to the, 
CNC torch plus filament maker. Okay, so let's start with the CNC torch. So I'm just going to continue recording this meeting right here. Um, I want to have um, so we got so Dixon particularly, Oliver, and Abraham, and Chaz are the developers on that. So may, I, I know that Oliver has got, done some excellent work. The current status of that was that we're developing a torch height controller, which is a critical part of following the torch or along the metal. That's a missing link because we've got the mechanical structure. We can do that with the, the 3D printer construction set parts, but we need the, the height following. So, um, so Oliver, can you fill us in on where you're at? Because I know you, you did some work on it. And let's work in a doc the respective document there. So that document is actually linked from the. If you go to. To the CNC torch table Hello? link on can page you four. Hear me? Yes, sir, we yes, sir, we can. Ah, that's very nice. Okay. Yeah, um, torch table height controller. Um, as you can see in my log, I've started to rework uh, the uh, PCB circuit from Paul. Yeah. And um, yeah. I had to um, uh, rework it from scratch because of uh, changing of 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 the uh, of the KiCad version. The the version 4.05 was a, the major thing. So. Uh, it was easier to do it from scratch now. And really? Yeah, okay. I did it so far. And what I have uh, uh, so far reached is the status of what Paul did. Ah, yeah, there it is. That's, that's nice. And uh, as you can see in the schema, I have put all the stuff a bit left to the right side to um, get more uh, space for other things. Yeah, there. So I, I, it was just a quick, um, yeah, to get on the on the on the level of Paul. Mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I did not made holes and things. This stuff all all we can can do later. But what I have in mind, uh, what I want to do next? Ah, yeah, that's that's a TV six thousand stepper driver which yep. arrived today. This is a three D version of the thing. And what I have in mind to do next on it, that is uh, adding a few more interfaces, like one interface for uh, SD keypad, a user interface. I, I think you mentioned one day something about a drop dial or something. Maybe I do it first time with buttons, however, but on the main board there comes only an interface for that. And. Um, Second thing uh, would be to add um, um, another interface for the TB6600 stepper, stepper driver, which I ordered one and received it today. Looks nice, nice thing. And uh, the third thing is that I, I think I want to try to um, add an Arduino Nano directly on the board. I'm don't know exactly whether the nano would be sufficient but i'm i've done much stuff with arduino nanos and they are sometimes surprisingly good and the processor the atme processor the cpu is the same thing which also is in an atmega uh, 256 which is the next next bigger bigger thing but uh, maybe we can fit a, a nice um, arduino nano thing uh, with onto the board, so um, we would have a nice PCB and circuit, and then yeah, we will see what what happens. Um, I have to I have to uh, say um, that I'm not very good in electronics, <laughs> but I can I can do things like that. I can I can reproduce ready-made recipes. Uh -huh. yeah, I can bake things after a plan. Yeah? And I'm used to uh, 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 solder and make PCBs and, and so on. What I want to say is I can make this thing ready and then give it a try. And then I will see where, whether some, some height sensings come out. If they are doing so, then it will be no problem to add that to the, um, 
to the um, to the axis to the z z axis. I already started, as you have seen, printing uh, one axis, and I'm doing one. So I may be doing this in, in a smaller dimensioned uh, example version, but I can at least try to deploy the TB6600 stepper driver and so on. And I also have uh, already an idea um, what to do with the fir firmware of this circle. I mean, uh, we have talked on this a little bit on the network and agreed that it should be completely external, standalone, autonomously running. So it's a very nice terminated uh, uh, task and yeah and I have also uh, an idea what to do with the, with the software if you're interested in just to tell I've um, made a drill automat which is also driven with ramps and there I, I found it um, um, uh, helpful that I used for the firmware an old version of Sprinter. Maybe some of your 3D printer, old 3D printer guys remember the Sprinter, which is the predecessor of Marlin. And the advantage of this is it's very, very small and therefore very good surveyable. Yeah, it's very easy to, to um, understand this code. This are only a few lines of Arduino code. And uh, this would probably perfectly for for fitting uh, for the seats uh, for the for the firmware of the uh, height controller thing application and yeah and that's the way I I I plan to to go into. Ladies and gentlemen, it sounds like we've got a player on our team <laughs> who actually knows what they're talking about. Um, no, this is. Um, immediate feedback is that this is extremely good uh, what you have done is uh, just to repeat so you've taken the circuit that we we had another guy design a few years ago you already have it put into KiCad from scratch because of the new um, basically because KiCad new version uh, you got this 3d is this 3d from um, KiCad itself Uh, sorry, I muted you there. You gotta unmute yourself. Yes, that, that's a feature of um, KiCad, and I can strongly um, advise, but I've seen you are going into that way, to add KiCad on your list of main tools which are yes. needed for all this kind of. For me, KiCad is similar like FreeCAD. Both are wonderful tools, and I'm eager to learn them, yeah, because we can pretty good things do with them. And um, this 3D is a feature of the KiCad and is one reason why I like uh, KiCad meanwhile more than Eagle. I was years long fiddling around with Eagle and meanwhile it's nearly impossible to um, to even get their freeware version download for checking some, some uh, uh, um, uh, schematas or whatever from other projects without giving them all your address privacy and stuff and so either it's good that KiCad is, is meanwhile in a, in, a, in a state where you can really start work with it and uh, doing things and this is a really nice feature the drive 3D stuff I like that much I love it this is the good old fight of good versus evil succeeding here is this um, is this file exportable into KiCad? You mean into FreeCAD? So, sorry. Uh, From KiCad into FreeCAD? Yes, yes, as a 3D file? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm still uh, working on it. I, I think it is uh, exportable in step format. I'm wow. in another project with, with, a, uh, with a solar uh, uh, PCB VMS thing, and there we're just trying that, and it seems to look... I, I will later post a, a photograph that shows yeah. combination yeah. of KiCad out, output within FreeCAD. You know what should happen but here? I'll that later. Uh, let me mute you again. Uh, uh, what? Let me mute you again. Uh, so this is a perfect case of... Um, you know, so obviously you know much more about KiCad than all of us here. Uh, maybe out, possibly outside of Cedric, because I know he's. I think he used some KiCad before. I have not. I just uh, opened it up a couple of times to open up some files. But you know, Joseph, 
you know, thinking about this, this is a perfect case of uh, of a case where we can go to Oliver and say, hey, uh, tell me how you did this and teach me so I actually learn too. So, so therefore, both of you would have to do it in a, such a simplistic way that it's uh, understandable by the common person. That would be awesome. Uh, so that's just a side side comment on how we can learn here. But no, this is really good because we can learn so much from you. So first of all, my first question to you is, do you understand the logic? Like when you actually redid Paul's circuit, do you understand the logic of how the the circuit works? So you're basically taking a capacitance signal from that little pickup loop. So the idea there is we've got this uh, this pickup loop. So this is the professional version. This is what we're open sourcing here. This thing is is the thing that comes close to the metal and it picks up a capacitance. Uh, and then there's um, that metal wire, this capacitance signal that's connected to our little circuit board. And that capacitance signal is converted into a voltage, right? So can you tell us more about that process or how much you understand of how the actual circuit works? To be honest, honest, I I'm very weak in analog electronics, and I didn't care very much about how this exactly works. I had the feeling that the Paul guy was a good man, and I give it a try. And when I have the circuit ready, I will see whether I um, receive some signals. But how the loop uh, um, on a capacitive level works um, is for me completely black box, and I guess it's also not really know for me to know exactly how it works as long as uh, it will produce some signals but i think if it, this would be not the case you wouldn't have come in this project so far so but yeah. for me the most important point is, is that the sensor thing is the heat resistance resistance yeah and i'm i'm dealing here with with pieces with building blocks yeah and i'm not necessarily into each building block that means if if there doesn't come out any signal or it, it's, it's not suited for the applications, then I'm probably lost. <laughs> uh huh. Okay, so talking about, so the way we connect, just like the basics for anybody, so we got this circuit little thing. So how does this actually get wired up? So you talked about the Arduino Nano and connecting that to, uh, so, so this, so, uh, so there's gonna be a microcontroller that picks up signals from this, reads it, and then says, okay, motor, move up or down based on the strength of the capacitance signal. So how do we wire that into here? I see J1 and J2 headers. Uh, so what is, um, can you tell us the connection? Yeah, also to the right, the three pin header is the one which is uh, where the sensor is connected. And I'm going okay. to replace this pin header with a screw terminal. I think that's better suited for the handling. And uh, on the left side, you see um, a four, four pin, pin header. Yep. And that's the I square C bus with okay. which uh, the Arduino uh, is connected to. Uh, in between there is some uh, the AD7747. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, whatever chip who, chip who do this capacitive stuff and then uh, gets out the I square C signals. And um, my main concern was only um, I also have in mind the user interface where I want to try to deploy a nice OLED panel and some buttons and uh, I have this idea since longer in my head and uh, want, would like to do a version where the data transfers also uh, with I2C bus and I2C is a bus system so theoretically it should not interfere with the sensing stuff but on the other hand I'm I was thinking hmm, maybe um, the sensing stuff is time critical so maybe I would better do the communication with the user panel interface um, by uh, some other pins so not necessarily with I2C so that so that we can use the full bandwidth for the sensing, and that means that the, the feedback, feedback loop within the height control thing uh, is maybe has, has better performance than if it's doing the, the user interface communication on the same line. 
that was my my idea. I mean, uh, I was thinking uh, whether it would be good to try to do with the Arduino Nano. I think it is, but in the other option, what would be an Arduino Mega? Um, if this would be uh, the the thing of choice, then an Arduino Mega has got uh, more I square C buses on board. But I I think we can do it with a Nano by using for the uh, user interface communication, maybe the SPI bus or serial lines or whatever. I'm, I'm thinking on that. Yeah, and that's the big plan. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Um, we use a lot of, um, let me see, just, just some considerations here. Um, is there a cost advantage to the Arduino Nano? How much does it cost? Because you can get cheapo, Arduino Megas for like ten dollars so I would say maybe just since we use a lot of Megas already maybe just stick to Mega for now and um, I think that would work work well let me go back to the page and ask more questions so we've got um, the probe that which is gonna be a BNC connector like basically a, a noise proof connector on J2 and then here we connect to the Arduino uh, can you explain a little more about um, what you understand about the timing of the signal like how that communication happens is that like from what you've read on our wiki um, what what is the issue there so in principle it's like like the you know if I think about this it's like okay I'm, I'm getting a signal in from the pick the pickup the capacitive loop that's coming into J2 and this this circuit whatever it does it outputs a DC voltage level right so where would there be any issues on like timing or like can you explain any of that like what the challenge there was you're muted again Uh, Oliver uh, can't hear you. Now better? That's better. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Ah, okay. That's been clear. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Uh, what I want to say. Um, 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 as a first first thing at all, um, whether Arduino Nano or Mega, in terms of prices, it makes a difference about ten dollars or euros, uh, or uh, seven to ten. I guess here in Germany, I pay eleven or twelve euros for a Mega, and about three euros for Arduino Nano. But uh, I think the price is not the point in here. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the main argument would be that. In my opinion, or from my point of view, I assume that a nano is completely sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's the one thing. So I just want to give it a try, and yeah. uh, uh, it would be no big deal then later if if we want to to adopt it to a mega or something. But uh, from the first moment, there is no yeah. reason, and then the PCB is a little bit more slimline, smarter, smaller. This stuff. That's that's the main uh, uh, reasons. So you thing you asked about the yeah. I square C uh, timing uh, thing. Yet, yet at the moment, I, I have no clue how how the signal exactly looks like. And I think it's not uh, probably not very time critical. It was what I said before was more a general uh, um, thought. To, to, to save the bandwidth uh, alone for the for the uh, data sensoring and um, the I square C bus is a thing which is often used um, within PCB boards to communicate with one module or another it's very widespread in industries and it's um, ah, sort of fast and reliable not too much reliable. But, um, I mean, uh, for example, if the environment is very noisy and that should be a problem, then it would be possible, for example, to take the 
C-A-N, the CAN bus as underlying hardware transport uh, um, yeah, protocol or, or module and uh, uh, then adopt I2C communication protocol on top of it. Uh, but this is also a thing where, where I assume um, we, we have to test it and uh, maybe, maybe it runs from the scratch. I mean, uh, this would has been in the end the, the reason or one reason why you switched over from, uh, from the plasma torch to the oxyfuel torch because it's quite more simple, has not got all this stuff with, with noise uh, uh, shielding and so on. And uh, yeah, I, I would just say we give it a try. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, that's yeah. good. That's excellent. Yeah. Excellent uh -huh. work there. Uh, let's see. Let's see what other questions would I have here. Um, where is that? Right here. Um, let's see. Let's see. Are you, do you actually say, did you say that you have the capacity to actually mill that or would you send this out for, for fabrication? Because you said something about a, you already have a little CNC drill that you can drill holes, like through holes with, and were you planning to actually put the the nano right on a board with like through holes or something? Or tell me more. And unmute yourself first, though. Yeah, thanks for the unmuted. <laughs> Um, no, the drill I was talking about is not a PCP. Uh, for PCB, it was uh, um, a thing, I, a CNC drill, which I made for other things. It's a bigger okay. one, and it's not really perfectly running, so mm -hmm. that's not suited. And uh, I think I will uh, let do um, the PCBs made by a professional company yeah. immediately. And I plan to do it mostly uh, with SMD parts, meaning the mm -hmm. headers and stuff are, of course, through hole. Uh, but uh, for example, the AD is only uh, the AD seven seven four seven is only available as SMD part. That's one reason. And another reason is um, I have my whole life tried to get around uh, uh, soldering SMD parts and with one other project now it hit me and I have to learn that stuff so it is possible so what I plan to do is to just uh, let produce uh, some test versions of the PCB and then will I solder the SMD parts onto it by hand which is a good uh, Zen meditation exercise for me because I'm really really bad in this <laughs> I order more than one board and with them more one part so yeah that's right. excellent excellent no that's that's really good i mean you're you just uh, what's 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 really good here actually is that we were able to take the design from before which which we generated a few years ago actually but we never got this running here um simply because the person who was here like time was up and we didn't get it finished and then nobody picked it up so we dropped it before but it's nice to see that now we put it back into KiCad. We've got the open source uh, files and everything, and we're gonna get the boards redone. That's really good. Um, so, is there anything that's that you need uh, before you go further on this, or everything is pretty clear? And once again, unmute yourself. Yeah, at the moment everything is clear. I have completely the way. Like I said, my next uh, immediately next step would be to implement all these interfaces uh, into the uh, PCB, and yeah, then I would start to um, uh, order it from somewhere or at first uh, export the GABA files and whatever the producer wants to have. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I would go to Mauser and uh, make a part list. I mean, some of the parts like resistors and capacitors, maybe I have in stock, but uh, they are not costing much. So I will do a complete uh, BOM list for ordering there. And I've seen there is a possibility to make such lists if they are project related, visible to others also, meaning 
we can link from the project project page in the wiki to that and uh, yeah then everyone can order or can order it and i will give it a try at first excellent is, I, is mean, it? I mean the parts are not very expensive this ad uh, is processor is about ten dollars and the rest is what we call in germany hühnerfutter means uh, chicken feet <laughs> okay okay uh, as far as soldering the fine connections on that that chip is that possible by hand um, yeah, I guess uh, it will be. Like I said, I'm nervous on it and uh, really need the exercise on it. But I've uh, in between tried to solder um, uh, as an E parts, which were quite more harder, like an STM32 arm chip, which is about one square centimeter in size and has 48 pins. Yeah, <laughs> and that was a real challenge for me. So uh, compared to this, I, I think this will be uh, easier possible. And when designing the PCB, I extra intentionally have left some some more space between the uh, SMD part to make it easier for me to sol solder it by hand. What in other words mean, uh, if one day it would be necessarily to yeah, to get the SMP parts a little bit closer together to gain more space, then uh, it can be done. But uh, if not, then like this, it will be easier to solder. So I'm, I'm confident that, that I, I will um, uh, solve this problem or will be able to solder <laughs> them and everyone okay. else probably also. <laughs> excellent, excellent. That would be good. It's a psychological to... thing. Okay, that will be a psychological okay. boost. Well, this is... Um, that's great so um thanks a lot for doing that that's awesome work and um let's see i want to check in with abraham on that also uh abraham do you have any comments on what you've been looking at as far as the capacitive height sensor uh, i know you mentioned that you you got some insights on this well yeah i was learning about the THC concept and everything. Now I have a clue about it. I, I'm i following the steps of, of Oliver, but I would like to talk with him because I so knew I don't know how to do that. Because I have realized that I was doing the same things. I was going to keep us and everything and installing it. And, but I have found also this that I could like your opinion and Oliver's opinion about it. It is simple, only operational amplifiers, amplifiers and optocoupler, and I don't know. But I must to say that, for example, if I want to replicate them right now, I have limitations. My PCD mill machine, I must to learn better to work with it. And I have never soldered with SMD. That are my limitations right now. Mm hmm yeah so yeah um abraham we're we're gonna talk tomorrow so let's talk tomorrow about how we're gonna get you involved in the prototyping and also about your circuit mill we're gonna be building a circuit mill here as well and i don't know if we can share some experience on that so um abraham um i think feel free to to communicate with with Oliver on details also we'll talk we'll talk again tomorrow then and maybe I don't know Oliver would you would you be around tomorrow to discuss this in detail about how to how to maybe come come up with a strategy to prototype it possibly in parallel cuz um yeah okay perfect that's okay um, yeah. can I say something yeah yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, tomorrow I have no time, but however, I have meanwhile checked what Abraham has explored so far, meaning the um, Arduino THC thing, and found it interesting and have looked at the GitHub sources, sources and stuff. Um, uh, and uh, it's probably uh, interesting to follow this way also, or I think if, if you would try, we must re-engineer it like 
following his his uh, uh, schema like I have done with Paul stuff, meaning porting it to PCAT maybe. And this is because uh, it's an NC NC license, so we Oops. would not take it directly, but would maybe no big problem to, to re-engineer it, maybe. What I uh, want to say is, however, that I following Abraham's log and see what he is doing, and of course would like to <laughs> communicate with him about that. We can can meet at any time or at the, at the network sport and stuff. So we will co coordinate us. Yeah, excellent. Um, another excellent. Another point: what I wanted to mention, what I've forgotten to say, is um, I have today received my TB six six thousand driver controller and so on. And when I'm hanging this onto the Arduino, this is exactly that kind of stuff what the chess is at the moment uh, doing. And maybe I can can help with him, yeah. him with that also, or this Excellent. will show him uh, uh, the right way. These are things which I think are not big problem, like you said last time. I guess maybe one of its biggest problems is that uh, he has no uh, uh, pro producer model number from the motors and uh, therefore don't know exactly uh, how to uh, um, connect them. But uh, this, this can be solved. There are, are also um, um, tutorials on the net how to find out which loops are in your stepper motor, like you mentioned today. But how to connect the TB6600 driver, this is what I can explore and demonstrate for him and then this maybe will him f help him further. And with Ab Abraham, I'm also um, lurking and we can communicate like on the network or uh, in a, in a two-person two video chat or whatever. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. Uh-huh. That yeah. sounds great. Yeah. Ah, yeah. They are the Rams. Yep. That's cool. Chaz, uh, do you have any, any feedback right now? Or? Well, I'm just looking at the iron and the iron file in German. Yeah, I think the iron file is in German. Yeah, it's German. The chat box. It has the ramps um, 1.4 EB6560 attached to the motor drives and power supply. Looks like a good, looked like a good example, so I got that posted. Yep. Um, I've got to purchase some wires for uh, connecting the power supply to the, I guess TB sixty five or sixty six hundred, and also the. Um, I got to figure out how to attach the. I have a diagram for like the ramps, attaching to the motor drives. And on this one, I have an, an example of cash or. I have another one attaching the TB6600 to the motor drive, so i got to figure out which is which. And right now I'm going to reference this um, file I just uploaded mainly mm -hmm. to you guys as the main one for reference. Yeah. I'm not sure about the... Um, yep, the so yeah, follow TB6600 this. TB6600 signal wiring. Mm -hmm. How the, yeah, I'm still looking at the diagram and figuring it out. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, Oliver, maybe you can help uh, help Chaz as well on that. I think sounds like you've got a little more experience on the wiring part. But basically, you take two pins from where the steppers were. Sorry, I'm going to mute you. Mute you again. Um, yeah, taking basically two pins. So this is where like all the stepper drivers were on the ramps here. Just two pins there, and then two of those pins, and I guess five V, and then. Kuda, where? <laughs> it's, this also asks where. Uh, so yeah, maybe uh, Oliver, can you help help Chaz figure that? It sounds like you you already know the answer. Yes, it's mainly the deer, the enable, and the step pins. That's always the same. It's the same with Polulus. It's also the same with the TB six thousand six hundred. And I, I definitely will just assist to to get these things in order. Yeah. I've done that before, and so yeah. I am confident that we will excellent, solve excellent. this quickly. Um, so far, I have to leave now because okay. I have another yep. uh, meeting then, and. 
Yeah. We'll, we'll see us next time and on the net and so on. Yeah. Okay. Have a nice evening. Thank All you, Oliver. Right. Thanks so much. Bye. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Excellent. Okay, that sounds good. Chaz, so it looks like, yeah, just communicate with Oliver. He can hook you up to what he said. I think the best thing to do is to ask him for a, a simple wiring diagram, and then we can just follow that with a specific, all the pins is set up exactly as we have for our system, including power supply and everything else. So that would be good. Um, then we can just test it. I mean, just, I guess, uh, if you've got the Arduino and you've got the power supply, we got some of the wires. Do you have a, if you have a stepper motor, you can just uh, make it work with a sample uh, sample code. Like you can use Cura or just, just to move the motor, you know, like just plug in to say the X axis and you just can move it with, with like 3D printer control software. Um, does that sound good? For the most part, um, which software are you referring to again? Yeah, yeah, I mean, see, the 3D printer control software, you can r use that just in this case to test whether the, the stepper motor is working. And that's Cura. Uh, you can download Cura, and when you connect... Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Marlin, just upload Marlin, like, for example, the D3D Marlin, like what, what we have on our wiki. Uh, that would work. You just put that onto the the board here and then use cure and it, you should be able to just hit like manually just run one axis and you should see your motor spin so that's that's what should happen mm -hmm. yeah okay the only other thing that I have to do right now is um I'm still troubleshooting the six wire motor to figure, figure out which four wires I need to use yep. which two I can just forget yep yep yeah yeah you'd need to google on the internet for that maybe ask Oliver more about that not sure that that should be easy to find. Yep. Um, there should be diagrams when if you search about six motor, six wire versus four wire motors. That that should you should get some info on that. I don't know the exact details, but that's I good. I think I found one already, which I just I'm just troubleshooting now. But here it is. Um, yep. Yep. So we want to get into yeah. So we want to, uh, we're kind of behind time on the on the filament extruder. So let's get into that. And yeah, that looks like uh, that could work. So it's gonna like troubleshoot a little bit. Yep. Plus six wire. Just made a note of that. Okay, excellent. Yeah. So keep working on that. Um, should be able to figure that out and go from there. Okay, let's move right into the um, the filament maker. So, Abe, can you um, pipe in on that? So where we're at as far as the latest pr progress on that? Yes. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. So, yeah, I recently got another email uh, back from Kim Lyman again this morning. Oh, okay. And it looks like uh, he's looking through the uh, his files. He kind of thinks that there might be a little bit difficult for us to make sense of, but he's going to try to put together some kind of drawings uh, for us. So uh, that might help quite a bit. We've been kind of going back and forth on how to do those had drawings depending on what files he has, but and he wasn't specific about the file, so I may talk to him more about that. And I don't know, that might take a while, so I think we probably need to move uh, forward with mm -hmm. uh, most of the CAD stuff that we can. Yeah, which uh, would be it's not likely to be related to that. Yeah, uh, which part would you say that would be? Would that be and, the um, let's see, it's for the visual bomb? I've nearly got that. Uh, I was asking, um, as far as moving forward on some of the CAD for the extruder, would it be more about the yeah, 3D printed like parts? Yeah, uh, Dixon has worked on a, a... Yeah. Yeah, it looks like Dixon has been moving forward with a good 3D parts page for mm -hmm. everything, so we have a place to put everything well, and I think that... Uh, Mainly, we can work on the 3D parts that uh, have to be imported 
and hopefully we don't have to redraw uh, or trace as many if if Q has those uh, files if there's something we can use. But yeah, so oh, very nice. We might have to pick which ones to prioritize. Uh huh. Which is are these... probably parts that are uh, not the the plastics. Wow. Well, wow, that's so we're we're pretty good on the part the plastics part library, eh? That's really good. Thanks, Dixon. Yeah, yeah. I've just been I've uploaded those in bulk in one go and have been I I need to I've been trying to figure out what the best way to organize it is and figure out what constitutes an assembly and a subassembly because there's like three different housings and then the hopper assembly. Mm. I'm not quite sure how to organize that yet. Uh huh. Um, but I think. Probably what we should do on CAD first is my plan is to get what files I can from McMaster. Yeah. And then get general dimensions of like the motors and make a, a rough out shape of those. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then leave leave all of the printed parts until last. And if we get to those before we hear more from Mr. Lyman, then then we'll start with the, the simplest ones like the knobs. And, and the direct the things that are just a single extrusion is what I'm thinking. Nice. Yeah. No, that's that's a good plan. Uh huh. I like it. Yeah, that sounds good. Cool. Yep. Yeah. So uh, you would work on just pulling some of the parts from McMaster and drawing up some very simple ones. Yeah, there's only a handful. Um, I mean, I guess most of the fasteners I could either get from McMaster or make in the fastener workbench. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, I mean, there's probably more printed parts than not printed parts. Um, and I haven't gotten to the, do anything on the spooler yet. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that there will be a whole different section with its own gallery for the spooler. Because okay. it's almost a different de device, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, unless that doesn't make sense. No, that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm planning on, I'm going to find all the parts that I can get pre-made CAD files for and conform them to pre-CAD files. I'm not, I don't know what that entails at all yet, so we'll see how that goes. Um, and then we'll move on to the stuff that we have to actually generate ourselves. Hopefully, I should be able to get to that, that this this week. That's good. No, that's that's really good progress. So... So yeah, we'll make make that 3D CAD happen. Uh, let's see, Cassie, we can definitely use her help on putting some of that together. What, was, what would your priority order be, like on the, the spooler? Uh, would you do that before you start the McMaster car, or maybe...? Yeah, I, I guess it would make more sense for me to get all of the uh, images that, that come in his Thingiverse download up on there first and kind of yeah so I'll, I'll work on getting the format of the parts library fleshed out first so that other people can more easily work on adding stuff to it okay um, I think that would probably be a, a better thing for me to finish first do you think probably probably um, so you're saying that in the big library section that you have already it's not like some of them might be repeats and all that like it's not clear how they yeah. fit together. Yeah, I, I need to look more closely because some of, some of the parts look, I, I need to go through it again because I was kind of tired when I did it, but some of the, it looked like some of the parts were, or some of the images were labeled for the wrong part and there were some duplicate images and the parts might be the same. I, I just haven't had time to, to check, you know, they might be one part that goes on two assemblies. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it, I'll, I'll get that, I'll get all of the um, images for the printed parts we have arranged in the, li in the library and try and arrange it better. And then, um, so if this week, some, if someone else wants to start making rough out CAD parts and getting the McMaster parts, um, that might be better if someone else needs tasking on this extruder project. Yeah, yeah, uh, see if, if Cassie can do some of that. Now, uh, according to our working document, how would you suggest doing it? So you got all the the 3D printed parts, so you would want to just go through the visual 
diagrams and just start pulling, you know, looking looking for sources. Um, Abe, Abe and um, Nixon, what do you think? We don't have a specific person though to 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 jump on that though, so that'll be yeah. We don't have more people at this point. Only, only person is Cassie. So if, if we can get her possibly to work on, I mean, the clear clear directions would be to just go page by page through the Lyman Film and Extruder V6 this document right here, and just start pulling in the parts mm -hmm. right. What what's what are your thoughts on you know things like okay there's the power supply or whatever I mean how do we do that it's like uh, just do a simple rendering of that or or maybe there's files online already um, the, both I mean whatever we can find right yeah the larger parts like the power supply and some of these devices the circuit boards the relay I figured the only thing that's really critical is just kind of the extents of right. the objects and they can be kind of drawn simply like Nixon was saying mm -hmm. uh, we just need like the maximum um, yep. you know height of parts on right. the circuit board or the extents of certain parts mm -hmm. to be drawn right so for example if we click on like say this this power supply the idea would be see if they have dimensions or a technical drawing and we can pull that directly off there but I mean you know like the worst case scenario there it's like it says size 8.46 by 4.53 by 1.97 yeah I mean that's that's right there is I guess good enough to drop a, like a simple box and um, yeah I think I think for the overall model because yes. it's gonna get pretty heavy yeah. like we could just draw it up like okay here's the here's the box maybe just draw like this indent on the front like bite out that front section and call it the power supply you know just once again just to represent its shape and so forth yeah, yeah, that would be good. Because uh, there is a lot of parts here, so you know the weight might add up if we have the exact files for everything. So maybe just uh, kind of try to manage it as best as we can. And it would be definitely good to say, okay, here's one page. Like you know, make separate uh, FreeCAD files. Like okay, this page has the has the platform and those those components. Um, this thing is the extruder, so it's like it'll be another file. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it would be useful to break it down into the most logical sense, like in bite-sized chunks. So that's that's why I actually put this system diagram thing. Uh, let's see, can we maybe collaboratively just put little boxes for what are all the critical parts? I'm gonna. Just, just kind of basic breakdown for the different different files that we want to have, because because you don't want to do like one master file starting with one big file for the whole thing. You just want to do, as I mentioned before, do multiple files that you can then load into a final file. That's that's the best workflow. So, so let's see what are what are those sections. Um, let, let's break it down into like five or or ten sections that we have. So. Um go ahead you can you can edit that right Can you guys edit that Okay So making Yeah so maybe like so someone is not overwhelmed so say we look at page the first page we see extruder power supply let's say extruder electronics Um, next one would be extruder barrel, I guess. 
Um. <laughs> yeah, I would say extruder barrel is like a separate thing up to up to its flange. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Let's see what Because there's like a separate exploded parts diagram for the up to that flange, but then it also goes all the way back through the auger to the auger motor, and that looks like one pretty solid assembly to me. Oh wait, am I looking at the wrong thing? There's the whole hopper plastic assembly. Maybe maybe do like the whole hopper plastic assembly, um, like the whole big box. So I'm gonna call it the big. What's the electronic PCBs? There's the extruder electronics. Is that the same thing? Uh, electronic PCBs, I'm thinking there's VRMs and so on for the spooler. Ah, okay. So spooler. So I'm going to hyperlink Extruder Electronics to the page. And we've got some optional uh, VRM electronics for the uh, extruder. Filament winder. So there's winder and winder electronics. Let's see, filament winder. When you say spooler, that means winder. Well, the I think I've been referring to the winder part. Let's see, there's the pre-tension system. Okay. For it, and then there's the spool itself. So. Yeah, the, I think he refers to the spooler as like an optional thing, because in some of the images he just has it spooling up on the floor, like coiling on the floor. And so I think well, the spooler and the winder are two separate assemblies he's referring to, right? Uh, to some extent, obviously we want the actual spool, but right. yeah, so we don't want to spool it onto there. There's some optional parts there, like his auto auto winder, wind leveler, but the, uh, the, the 
part that's controlled by the voltage regulators is kind of a possibly a pre-tension system before it winds because it's got those rollers and I assume that there's sort of a relationship between the two voltage regulators to tension that filament before it goes onto the spool. So oh, I probably see. should consider the, uh, the sort of pre-spool part as the uh, wind, not really the wind mechanism, I guess you could call it the tension mechanism. Yeah, I was getting thrown off by his naming. I couldn't figure out if he was referring to separate things yeah. or not. He, I think, he uses different terms in different places in the file, but so we call yeah, it, it. It looks like it's put together from several stages of development. Yeah, that's what he says too. His files are um, very versioned, and so they're difficult to interpret. Yeah. Okay, so there's the... Wait, but there's... um. So there's the thing with the... Can you guys look at my... Um... Can you guys look at this picture here? So this is the... What are you calling this, Abe? The... Let's see, what I see is... Tensioner? Yeah, I would call the first part where it first feeds in through those rubber tubes a tensioner okay because tensioner it, it's putting some tension between the between that and the spooler who's playing music back there can you can you uh oh sorry that, i thought please? i was muted again okay so just just to get a visual understanding of this so this part here that's the tension mechanism right yes so this would be yeah let's let's get clear on this and then we can call it a day so this is extruder electronics so spool mechanism would be see where is that okay so maybe this one And then spooler electronics. Let's see. Spooler electronics, are you referring to both the voltage regulators or just like like this? Let's see. They're the same. They are the same regulators, so. Yeah. So what where easy just on page two there so spooler electronic PCBs so basically all those electronics including what's inside that little case yes that's a power supply the switch so can we say this plus power supply something like that separate the motors um, I guess I can, mm -hmm. the motors are similar but they're two different RPMs uh, the way they're geared
let's see in the thermal components we're not including that within the within uh extruder barrel to flange uh well, we we're going to separate it let's see when we're drawing There's... this up okay see, the electronics include the id uh there is uh, the thermocouple wiring. Uh, maybe we should just separate wiring. Uh, wiring as um, in the. It's just the. Uh huh. It's. Let's see, it's the K type thermometer as well as all those things that wrap around the barrel, I guess. Are, mostly that's just parts that are heat rated. Mm hmm. Extruder barrel plus flange. Does the auger go with the maybe with the extruder barrel? So barrel auger plus flange. Yeah, the auger is pretty well part of that system. Okay, so barrel plus auger plus flange. Mm -hmm. thermal components, <clears throat> the things that wrap around all those discs, like all those... Um... Yeah, there's, um, well, some of those are kind of... Welding well, blanket. there's the uh, MDF block that's behind the flange, mm -hmm. and then there's the welding blanket uh, around, and Kapton tape around the, uh, yeah. the end of, outside of the barrel. Right. Subcategories is motors. You don't want to put the motors with the assembly where they're attached. Oh, yeah. I guess we could do that. Um, or 
separate from the electronics since we specified that already. Uh, it could be with the assemblies. So maybe a, um, see we got the spool mechanism, see the tension mechanism could include the motor. So category unless well we could put I guess we could make a category for fasteners or some of the well, I don't know that's not critical though so maybe we don't need another category uh, so we want to get too detailed. I'll fix it. See where we're at here. There's a few optional components that I think we want to include in the, um, they're probably mostly in the electronics, uh, optional voltage regulators on the extruder and the fans and so on that are kind of in with the wiring. Okay. Um. I'm just look and see if we got all the major components here. So if we say spool mechanism, tension mechanism, spool electronics, big box enclosure, plus hopper, extruder electronics, Extra barrel plus auger flange, thermal components. I think, uh, does that cover, like if we say these seven items, that's, I mean, that's enough breakdown to kind of start piecing it in some kind of an orderly fashion? Yeah, that looks like it breaks it down uh, as far as the made for parts and the plastics and some of those are all part of those components, so. Right. Um. There's. Let's see. We, 
needed to, we could yeah, we break can... down some of the parts that are not connected together on the spooler system, but... Yeah, that looks like uh, it's probably enough categories. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. And let's see, as far as the most CAD that has to happen, yeah, every one of these is kind of like, perhaps like the, the biggest CAD job is the extruder barrel auger plus flange. I guess in terms of generating parts, maybe thermal components. Otherwise, a lot of the parts are included, like either like taken off the shelf parts or 3D printed parts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, sounds good. Yeah, the flange. The flange is probably the only uh, difficult part. I don't think that there's um, a McMaster Car CAD file for that. Right, but we can so start. We can probably start with the flange itself and then add holes to it, right? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Shouldn't be hard to draw in FreeCAD. Um, and I said that the plastic parts, we've already got STL files for those, so none of those are really a priority to if we have to retrace any of that. They're not immediately important, like the. Uh, Components that have to be ordered. Right. So the idea is that we're hoping that Mr. Lyman will provide the source files, which means we don't have to retrace the the STLs, right? Yes, he's says he's going to put some kind of drawing together mm -hmm. uh, out of his files that should be of help to us. Um, yeah not sure what that'll look like. I, I think that if he has a fairly complete uh, file to get, I guess, export DXFs from uh, those interchange files, we should be able to use those in FreeCAD. Yeah, step. I guess step would be the easiest, right? Step? Um, I'm not sure. He didn't mention step. I kept mentioning it, but he said he was using the uh, DWGs in AutoCAD 2011. So... Um, and he suggested that those were, he could export DXF files, uh, which is that AutoCAD uh, drawing exchange format from AutoCAD 2011, from his DWG files that are proprietary, I guess, to that AutoCAD uh, application. I guess the issue is he has so many versions of uh, drawings that... Uh, it's not well organized at the mm -hmm. moment. Did you say, did you ask him specifically for for step? I, I did mention that. Okay. Uh, and he suggested the DXFs. I, I, I'm not familiar with AutoCAD 2011, uh, but I'll uh, have to email him back since he responded with that earlier and see if he can export the step. He should be. Is just... that, that's preferable to the uh, DXFs? Yeah, absolutely. We know that okay. step is foolproof. DXFs might have some trouble. Okay. See. Okay, so we've got we've got the work cut out for us then. Looks like so. Yeah. That's good. All right. Uh, anything else we, we need to talk about? Let's see. I think that uh, that's covered for the CAD workup since we've got the page to put everything in and some categories that we can break it down and mm -hmm. over. Uh, left on the team, I guess uh, people are doing different things now, but we can kind of do, divide it up. Yeah. 
Yeah, this week I'll finish. I'll I'll finish um, tidying up that parts library page so that everything can go in there easily. Um, should I put the STL files that we have up there? You can see I've got spots for them. I uploaded a few, and then I realized that might be redundant if we're going to put everything in a free CAD file. Uh, the STLs are um, used or still, are they required for uh, printing normally? Because that's what yeah. converts directly to G-code, right? That's right. I figured. Um, yeah, we want to have those. I wasn't sure. Yeah. Once you have the free CAD, you don't want somebody going into FreeCAD, selecting parts and exporting to SDL. You want to have the SDL direct, so it's not okay. it's not redundant. So okay. I'll, that's, I'll, I'll throw those up too then. Yeah, uh, but hopefully we're uh, not we're not putting up parts from old files though. So do you know which ones are current? Um, sorry, say so which STL files? Are yeah, you mentioned that some of this might be redundant or old files, so. I'm just concerned that you're gonna be, uh, if you're gonna waste any work on putting up files that are old. So well, it was the images that seemed like they might be redundant. I haven't run into that with the STL files, but I haven't looked closely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that Mr. Lyman had basically said that uh, his files with the the CAD was uh, not what was organized, but it looks like the images in the STL files that he published to Thingiverse. And the zip files are correct relative to the uh, build materials and mm -hmm. some of the instructions. It's some of his photographs in the PDF that are different, probably because he just kept using old photographs. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If that's the case, then yeah, we should just upload the SDLs so we have them for everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I'll try to conform the sections to the work that I was just watching you guys do. Uh -huh. with that systems diagram is that how I should do that do you think yeah just group the parts by those chunks that would be good that would be good um, that okay. would give it at least some some form of uh, order uh-huh yeah all right I'll start with that then and we can massage it later depending on how well it works yeah 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 that sounds good cool excellent excellent so that's cool. And uh, Dixon, we're talking tomorrow then too, right? So yeah, two two p.m. your time, one p.m. my time, I think. Yep. Excellent. Okay. I think that sounds yeah. sounds great. So yeah, we'll uh, continue working this. This is good. Thanks a lot. Great. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. Take care. Bye bye then. All right. Good working with you guys. Yep. Bye. Thank you.